It's as beautiful as Napa Valley or Tuscany. Its outer coastal plain region has the same soil conditions as the Bordeaux region in France. Welcome to New Jersey Wine Country. Join us as we learn about the history of New Jersey wine, explore its vineyards, and learn why the state's wineries are producing award-winning wines. California may be the leading producer of wine in the United States and the most popular when it comes to consumption of American wines, but it wasn't always that way. In fact, California did not emerge as a major industry leader until 1976, when the Judgment of Paris was held, and California wines bested their French counterparts in a blind tasting. This historic event was covered by journalist George Tabor in Time magazine. He wrote a subsequent book, Judgment of Paris, and a movie called Bottle Shock was eventually produced. From that blind tasting, California's wine industry exploded. Today, many experts feel New Jersey is in a place comparable to where California was in 1976. Cameron Stark got his start in winemaking working in Napa Valley. He is now the winemaker for Unionville Vineyards and Ringos. Cameron knows the impact of what these competitions can have on the industry. The judgment of Princeton, I think, was was you know very similar to uh, what what happened to uh, California back in '76, where we actually, or, or California, found a way to to suddenly become a valid wine growing region. But when you're in a competition with uh, um, the best, let's say everybody's going to send in their best wines for a competition, and you can medal and come out on top. It's very rewarding, and it uh, just proves the fact that. Our wines are there, they, they, they can stand up to anything. The judgment of Paris, Chateau Montalena beat the French and that launched the entire California wine industry. I mean, that was huge. And California back then was thought of the same way that New Jersey is today. We just had a, uh, a competition in Princeton called the Judgment of uh, Princeton. Our wine quality was right up there with the uh, French wines. And this wasn't just like, you know, local people doing the judging. And this was from the Journal of uh, Wine Economists. So they were from all over the world. They were from France. They were from Belgium. I think like half of the top 10 in both red and white categories were New Jersey wines. And the other thing too is we're, we're sending our wines to competitions outside of New Jersey and winning bronze, silver, gold medals. We just won a big silver for our Dolcetto wine at the Atlantic Seaboard competition. Uh, there's the Finger Lake competition, uh, the San Francisco Chronicle competition. So there's a lot of uh, competitions that our wineries are entering into and getting really good recognition for our wines here. More than 200 years ago, London's Royal Society of the Arts recognized two New Jersey vintners for successfully producing the first bottles of quality wines. Similar to the other states of the Northeast, wine production for New Jersey started in the 1800s. In 1859, an agricultural society was created in the state and 40 types of grapes were tested to find those most suitable for the climate and soil. We have really good growing conditions here for grape. Uh, we have a, a well-drained, deep soil, uh, it's not over fertile. Uh, the grape grow very easily in fertile soils. You get a lot of vegetative growth, so that's why from the soils being able to dry out because they're well drained and not over nutritious, the, we, uh, the grape will put a lot of energy into their fruit rather than just into growing vegetatively. Our seasons uh, here where we are are long enough so we can really mature some nice red wines like Cabernet Sauvignons. Um, and then if you can mature your Cabernet Sauvignon, that means the other varieties, you can really get good maturity on that. It's, um, it's a, lot, a lot of my grape growing comes from just generations of farming, the, the, the experience we have here, knowing the ground, knowing the soils, uh, knowing our climate, gives us a little advantage as to uh, adapting the grape to this area. Well, initially in 1970, uh, we had pretty much grown all um, all Native American varieties and uh, we had a very bad crop uh, one year and my dad and my mom went up to the Finger Lakes and found all these uh, French American hybrid varieties that have been developed up at Cornell and they planted them and then from then from there uh, we began the process of planting some vinifera because we heard that they would uh, tolerate the, uh, the harsh winter and we weren't completely sold on the concept so we first planted Chardonnay I'd say in the mid 80s, uh, right behind the winery here, and those Chardonnay vines are still around. And from there, uh, we grew other vinifera varieties, uh, Cabernet Sauvignon, Petit Verdot, Cab Franc, uh, and Roccazzatelli, which we got from Frank Salick uh, from Sylvan Farms. 
and uh, who Frank had gotten them from Dr. Frank up at Constantine Frank Wine Cellars. So um, it, it became fairly obvious to us that some, the vinifera varieties, would grow very well. It's very difficult to grow uh, certain varieties like Zinvindel. It's just the, the summer's not quite long enough and you have winter damage. But selected varieties on specific rootstocks do very well. So that led us into that uh, kind of neighborhood and uh, the wine quality is excellent and allows us to make uh, vintage dated premium wines uh, that we've been selling now. So. so when people came here a couple hundred years ago they just knew that this was a good area for grape and uh, unfortunately Prohibition put a, put a hurting on the industry. There was hundreds of wineries around here, small wineries back before Prohibition and then after Prohibition they could just never start up again. Vineyards were concentrated in the location of Newark and Atlantic County, specifically Egg Harbor, where Renault Winery, the oldest commercial winery in New Jersey, was established by French immigrant Louis Renault in 1864. Louis Renault brought the original Vina Fera vines from France and produced his first wines in 1870. During Prohibition, Renault Winery remained open and obtained licenses to produce Sacramento wine for churches, as well as various medicinal wines, including Renault Wine Tonic. Joseph Milza and his family purchased the winery in 1970. Here, Joe describes how Renault Winery celebrated the end of Prohibition. It was repealed. It was the day that they lifted the Volstead Act and we were allowed to drink alcoholic beverages. It was in December of 1933. And in celebration of it, Renault took that horse and wagon with the barrel on it and took it out to the streets in Egg Harbor City for the people to taste wines. When Prohibition ended in 1933, the New Jersey legislature decided to license only one winery for every million residents in the state. Thus, the growth of the industry was very limited and was contingent on population increases of one million. Tomasello Winery is a uh, third generation New Jersey winery. Jack and I are only, the only third generation winemakers in the state. And the, the winery was originally started by my grandfather, uh, Frank Tomasello. Uh, who's on the right here. Uh, I think he's pictured with John D'Augustino from Renault Winery and this is one of Renault's uh, large wine barrels. He started the uh, winery in 1933 just after the repeal of Prohibition. The industry was helped immeasurably by the 1981 Farm Winery Act. Farm winery licenses were part of this legislation, allowing for smaller wineries to open and allowing retail sales at them. Tom Amabile, founder of Cream Ridge Winery in New Egypt, was one of the first wineries licensed under the new farm bill. It was in 1988, uh, April 16th, and I never forget the date because it's a day after income tax. We were involved with the New Jersey Wine Growers Association, and uh, of course, as you know, the uh, to build a winery like this, back in those days, it was uh, restricted. You, uh, the law was that if you want to build a winery with a building and have uh, tasting in the tasting room, you'd have to wait until the population changed. And I think it was five million at the time. When it changed to six million, there was a winery in North Jersey in Stockton. B&B uh, &B Vineyards, I think, was the name of it. And they lasted about a year. but. They were the one that took advantage of the change in population. And then the Wine Growers Association worked with the uh, le legislature to have farm wineries uh, like uh, this and, and uh, plenary wineries. Maddie Matarazzo, proprietor of Four Sisters Winery in Belvedere, recalls how the fledgling New Jersey wine market benefited from the 1981 Farm Bill thanks to the support of legislators. A number of other wineries that were a couple that were, had been established for many years, but they were under the pretense of the one winery uh, per million people. So there was uh, an opening for seven wineries. And just as we started into, based on seven million people in New Jersey, and uh, at that time, back in 1981, we started looking at the possibility of, of, of getting into the wine business. We had great support from the Department of Agriculture. We had great support um, from ABC for that matter um, and our legislators. The outer coastal plain of South Jersey is very similar to France in climate and in soil. This makes for world-class wines that are affordable and close to home. 
Two of the leading wineries in this region are producing award-winning wines. One is from the old school, the other is using modern technology. Hi, Frank DiCopolis here with Louis Caracciolo, and that's definitely Italian, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. From Amathea Cellars right here in Echo, New Jersey. We're here to talk about wines and wineries in New Jersey, of all things. I started making wine with my grandfather, who came over from Italy when he was 13. So um, I, I just got the passion for it, because my grandfather introduced me to what I call the archaic way of making wine. Part of what you're tasting is this style of winemaking, as we said before, there's many different styles, this is just one. This is the hands-off approach, so it's the integration that this wine will be in a barrel for nearly two years. Two years. So you're talking about a curing process, you're extracting subtle flavors from the oak, which uh, depending on the oak and the level of toast, we've toasted inside of the barrel, you could get vanilla, coconut, coffee bean, all that kind of thing winemakers talk about that it infuses into the wine. And over time it makes this sort of magical beverage that we talked about was made in the 1780s in the Bordeaux region. You get the great to peak perfection. You get it into here, crush it, settle it so it's optically clear, it goes into a barrel, and then it's racked. We change it from barrel to barrel you know, four or five times over the course of its life. This adds air, stabilizes it, develops oh, I didn't color. realize that you did that. Yes. I thought it, once it was in, it was in, then you just added to it. And oh, no. No, you just oh, monitor wow. the sulfur level, and then every, uh, depending on the wine, it could be racked three to five times over the course of its lifetime, where we actually um, mix it with air because it's part of the curing and part of the development process. Now, we were talking about the difference between old school winemaking as compared to modern technology winemaking. Well, you're you're the modern technology winemaking. Uh, basically, what we've done here at Sherrod Winery, uh, we've taken all of the uh, old school techniques um, and used some of the modern technology to perfect them. Uh, a lot of things like um, uh, temperature control, uh, as well as uh, precise pressing, um, and, you know, in careful viniculture. Uh, is what really kind of defines our wines. Um, we use all of the old school techniques that are required. I mean, you really can't make a great wine without barrels, but um, really in order to get those, those crisp whites mm -hmm. uh, for those white wines with the great fruit flavors, um, you need to be able to ferment those at, at precisely controlled temperatures, uh, the sweet spots for each individual uh, strain of yeast you're using, things like that. But with our system, mm -hmm. uh, basically we set a temperature and we allow the, uh, the system to, to hold that temperature for us. Um, by doing that, uh, we're able to slow down the fermentations if necessary, speed up the fermentations as necessary, uh, and keep them right where they should be uh, to, to get those, the, the exact flavor profile you're looking for in a wine. The, the last step, of course, once the fermentation is complete, is pressing. Mm -hmm. We have a computerized pressing system uh, that uses very gentle pressure uh, and over the course of almost two hours uh, presses the grapes to the ideal level so that you remove as much of the um, uh, liquid, the wine, from the, uh, the pumice that's left over mm -hmm. um, that you can without extracting any harsh flavors. In two, our 2008 vintage, we actually won uh, Best Chardonnay at the Finger Lakes International Wine Competition. While some New Jersey winemakers are still picking grapes by hand, others use harvester machines to clear the vines. Tomasello Winery uses the Gregoire, a French-made harvester that can do the job that once required 40 workers to do. Weather conditions are vital to producing good wine. Here, Mark Carduner, co-owner of Silver Decoy Winery in East Windsor, discusses a unique piece of equipment they use to track and collect real-time data on weather conditions. Now, this is a joint project that has been provided to us by uh, Cornell University along with Rutgers University to uh, grid our entire region and for us, most importantly, the state of New Jersey. Um, we're looking at weather and this weather station is being uh, powered by solar 
energy. Um, we're measuring rainfall, which is so very important. Uh, so many times uh, there are less technical gauges. This is very detailed. I can check from my home, from my car, from my uh, iPad at any moment how much rain we've had in the last 24 hours. Uh, we are measuring temperature, which for frost is so critical, bud break also critical. We have uh, moisture inside the canopy, which we're trying to uh, check to see when we need to spray for powdery mildew, downy mildew, uh, and, and wind speed. And all these issues um, are critical points of, of how we, we run our spray programs and how we try to keep our vines looking, looking so wonderful. But uh, thank you, Cornell. Thank you, Rutgers, for uh, being there with us. Uh, it's been a great, great help. Whether it's by hand or machine, once the grapes are harvested, they're sorted and go through the wine press before the fermentation process can begin. The ultimate goal of every winemaker is a perfect glass of wine. Whether you come by train, ferry boat, or in your car, New Jersey wineries are located in every section of the state. From the mountains of Sussex County to the Warren Hills in the west, across the rolling hills of Hunterdon County down to Gloucester and Salem counties, and to the tip of the state in Atlantic and Cape May counties, over 40 wineries now shape the landscape of the Garden State. Whether you want to travel all the way to the southernmost tip of the state in Cape May, where you can visit Cape May Winery, Natalie Vineyards, Cape May Courthouse, Hawkhaven Vineyards, Rio Grande, and two of the state's newest wineries, Jesse's Creek Winery, Cape May Courthouse, and Willow Creek Winery, West Cape May. Or travel north to Sussex County, where you can sample wines at Cava Winery, Hamburg, Ventimiglia Vineyards, Wantage, and Westfall Winery, Montague. There's a winery located within driving distance of your location. Those that want to head south or come a bit north from Philadelphia can explore the Gloucester Salem Wine Trail. Visiting such wineries as Auburn Road Vineyards, Piles Grove, Cedarvale Winery, Logan Township, DeBello Winery, Woolwich Township, Heritage Vineyards, Mullica Hills, Monroeville Vineyard and Winery, Monroeville, Swansea Vineyards, Shiloh, Wagon House Winery, Sweetsboro, and Southwind Vineyard and Winery, Millville. The Warren Hunterdon Wine Trail offers an eclectic array of wineries to visit, including Brook Hollow Winery, Columbia, Four Sisters Winery at Matarazzo Farms, Belvedere, Villa Milagro Vineyard, Pinesville, Benaducci Vineyard, Pittstown, Old York Cellars and Unionville Vineyards, Ringo's, Hopewell Valley Vineyards, Pennington, and Terhune Orchards Vineyard and Winery, Princeton. Those wishing to hit the Monmouth Ocean County region can experience the Shore Wine Trail visiting four JG's Orchards and Vineyard, Colts Neck. Cream Ridge Winery, Cream Ridge, Silver Decoy Winery, East Windsor, and Lorita Winery, New Egypt. The Atlantic County Wine Trail features such standout vineyards and wineries as Amalthea Cellars, Atco, Bellevue Winery, Landisville, Codorosa, Franklinville, Sherritt Winery, Blue Anchor, DiMatteo Vineyards, Plagido's Winery and Tomasello Winery, Hamilton, Renault Winery, Egg Harbor Township, and Valenzano Winery, Chemong. Visitors can also ask for the New Jersey Wine Passport at their stops. They can bring the passport to participating wineries to be stamped. Those having all of the pages stamped and thus having visited all the wineries in the state will be eligible for a drawing for a trip for two to an international wine destination such as Germany and Portugal. Throughout the year, the Garden State Wine Growers Association offers outdoor festivals like the annual Cape May Festival at the Cape May Ferry Terminal, where individuals can sample wines from over 20 wineries, enjoy great food, and be entertained by live musical entertainment. Each weekend, wineries throughout the state offer their own special events. The events offer something for everyone in the family, from taking the wine train in Warren Hills to Villa Milagro Winery, to attending a pig roast, grape stomping event, or just relaxing with loved ones and friends. New Jersey wineries offer a wealth of entertainment opportunities. You can find out what's happening at a winery near you by visiting www.NewJerseyWines.com and checking out the monthly activities list. And when you cannot make it out to a vineyard, consumers can now also purchase their favorite New Jersey wines online and by phone directly from New Jersey wineries. So what are you waiting for? Come on out and discover New Jersey wine country.